Welcome to Aftermath Episode 2. I'm Jason Hathcock, and I'm a uh, editor, designer, and researcher at themathcitadel.com. And I'm Rachel Trailer. I am the math founder and lead mathematician at The Math Citadel. The day a uh, conversation came up in the course of looking at some news, a particular article written recently by Martin Scorsese on the subject of film criticism. Backstory, Jason is our resident film critic here. Film critic, yeah, I, you know, in my spare time. I like movies, and I like to talk about movies, and I like to... I have opinions on them every now and then. I have opinions on them, too, but Jason doesn't like my opinions on movies. Oh, I love your opinions. Usually skewer movies. Movies I'm like, oh, no, give it a chance, and you're like, no, scorch it. Mm, you know, actually, with um, with this Scorsese article, I... Uh, sort of felt bad sometimes about skewering movies, and then at the same time, sort of not. It's helping me, we'll say, for my film critic, for whatever, opinions, for whatever that's worth, it's reaffirming or modifying some stuff. So let's kind of go through what this article talked about, because you sent it to me at first. Mm -hmm. So in general, what is he saying with this? Basically, uh, the main, the thrust of this, you know, this article he wrote seemed to be pointing the finger at Rotten Tomatoes and sort of the the review aggregator business in terms of how dangerous it could be to filmmakers and what it's doing to movies nowadays. So what happened? Why did it, what, what prompted him to write this? I believe the stance in the article is his take on a movie that came out recently called mother M O T H E R then an exclamation point starring Jennifer Lawrence and Javier Bardem. Uh, Basically, it came out, and I remember it having a lot of marketing to it. Like, I saw previews and stuff all over the place. And a lot of YouTube ads. And I believe what the what happened was, critically, it was not well-received. So, yeah, according to this article, it received an F cinema score. And see, I'm not super familiar with cinema score, but I do check Rotten Tomatoes. So I think it didn't do well on Rotten Tomatoes. And his his point was, I believe, it got to... The way this works now, the the impact this has on films being made as a whole is a dangerous thing. Because now what happens is people go on to review the movie and their the review content really has nothing to do with the film so much as it does with the business aspect. Like, oh, you know, maybe it didn't have this sort of budget or it did have this sort of budget and now it's not making that much money or you shouldn't go see it on that basis. And um, I agreed with a lot of his points in the article, but, uh, you know, I disagreed with a few of them, but it, for, at the very least, it was thought-provoking. It makes you think about how this works, because uh, how often do you go and check Rotten Tomatoes first thing when you hear about a movie? I know I do. So I think, at least when I read the article, the it's not so much the reviewers who are only going into a movie necessarily just looking at the business aspect. I think what he's kind of looking at is when people think about investing, because that's what it is. Movies are freaking expensive. Sure. When someone's thinking about possibly investing in it, you go straight to, you know, Rotten Tomatoes or whatever, and you look at the scores. What did well? What didn't do well? Did it have Rotten Tomatoes prestige? Did it have cinema score prestige? And then, hey, Look, I'm a statistician. I could break it down, run a neural network, identify the features of the movies that are good, and come up with a guaranteed blockbuster. Mm-hmm. Honestly, isn't Marvel kind of doing that? Probably so. Now, did, full stop. I freaking love Marvel movies. Okay, yeah. like they're they're doing it very well. But that's uh, that's not a criticism on them. I love Captain America. Okay, good um, stuff. But do you agree with that? I mean, if if you kind of end up with formulae. Do you end up with formulaic movies or constant rehashes of movies? And do you think that some of the the inability to take an artistic risk is due to some of these cinema scores, Rotten Tomatoes, basically the numbers, the aggregate numbers, mm. or box office numbers? Well, I mean, I think that like if you go back and historically, it was, you know, not that long ago, maybe five, ten years back from now. If you watch what happens whenever there's like some tightening of the purse strings in the industry, then very quickly you see that 
films that are released are either sequels or remakes. What worked already? And let's so like you said, is taking a safe, safe action. Are they really tightening their purse strings? Don't, it seems like movie budgets just keep getting bigger. I mean, when I say tightening the purse strings, I mean um, like across the country. I so see. So anytime there's a period of economic like um, this is no longer uh, we're not doing so well. And, the big companies and people that make the budgets for films like that, they're not willing to risk that much. Um, not as much as they normally would in, say, times of you know, booming. So what if I'm a filmmaker and, say, you know, I have a script for some new story that's never been told, and I go to, you know, a studio or, or whatever, and I say I need $2 million to make this movie. Mm. Is it likely? Do you think it's likely they're going to say no? I think, in ter- well, you know, I, I should point out right now, I'm definitely not an expert on how much movies cost and, like, what, what is actually needed to to make a movie to produce it. But uh, in terms of that sort of thing, if it's risky at all, like, $2 million, I think, isn't a lot to movie studios. No, I think, I mean, hundreds of millions are spent on, on movies now. Like, you know, even the crappy ones, like Transformers. Yeah, but when you say crappy, you got to how much do those movies make? Yeah, okay. We're so not t- at that point, we're not even talking about critical consensus in terms of is this a good film or not, like what people agree on is the experience, that's sheer dollar across the world. So let's switch and, and generalize this even, you know, because you're a musician as well. Yeah. Do you feel like the music industry does that too? Do you see a lot of formulaic sort of fairly interchangeable popular artists kind of and we're losing we're losing exposure or the the ones that are a little bit more I don't like to use the word progressive but we'll say different people that maybe work in 58 instead I, of your 44 oh, okay so they change time so you're well, like that. Um, as an example yes yes departing from deviating say from what is usually considered popular like okay. um Stuff that is popular changes the time, of course. But yeah, you're right. As soon as something makes it, then here come the the versions of it that are pretty much the same thing, but they follow up and they get tons of radio play and all that sort of stuff. But even historically, let's take even music and movies, right? You had you had kind of clear eras. Something radically new happened, say in music in the 70s or the 80s with different guitar sounds or yeah, something yeah. like that. Then everybody kind of did that fad for a little while, and then mm-hmm. the next one came along. But somebody had to invest in that next big thing. Mm-hmm. Do you think that the the gap between, you know, basically these radi- almost radical shifts in artistic styles are getting smaller bit by bit? In other words, like, you know, I think fashion's even kind of the same way to, to go on that end. Nobody's trying anything new, and when they do, it's marginal compared to the kind of new thing that was tried longer ago. Do you agree with that statement? I do, except with with a small like modification for it, say the um, the music industry or something. Now, while it is true that it probably won't take off in terms of doing something new, at least in that industry, a burgeoning artist or somebody with the new idea has channels they can take, so they can put their music on iTunes fairly easily. They can put their music on YouTube, and everyone can see it. Maybe it won't get popular. Maybe it won't get radio play. Maybe it, it won't take off. But at least they have a way to put it out there, which is not always the same with um, some other industries. That's true. Um, but if you want those, I mean, for those musicians, yeah, they can put it on YouTube for free. They can't make a living off that. Uh, not not with any like high likelihood. Of course, if you get if you manage to strike a you know, chord with people if like if, if you do happen to take off with some popularity then you get ad revenues i think yeah. after Lindsay a while sterling did that she yeah. was she's got some really cool stuff and i think this might might get to i, I mean you know music movies fashion um really at the i mean at the bottom of it always this common thread is the creative thought expression changing the ways that you think and making something uh, Outside of what is, say, at the heat of the moment. Like, is there room for that in a budget sense? Like, will it be invested in? Well, that's the thing is, like, people, I think what happens a lot in the creative areas, and and science is that way, too. 
right? What happens if I do this? Well, what's it going to get me? I don't know. Yeah, and well, and I'm I will contend right now that as far as research goes, there is absolutely an artistic element to it. You are creating something like. And and that those in, those bouts of inspiration sometimes come out of nowhere. Yeah. Sometimes those connections come out of nowhere. You're, you have an idea. You've kind of been, yeah, you know, like making some marginal progress on, and then out of nowhere for something totally different, you read it and you're just like, holy cow! Mm-hmm. Like there it is, right there, and you don't know where it came from, and all of a sudden, you've got you've got two papers, right? Just out of nowhere, but you can't. You can't put that on a development cycle. No. I don't think you can put music composition on a development cycle. Not not in a no, like no. Like if you gave me a deadline, if you said you have a month to write this song, I could give you something, but it wouldn't be my creative best. It wouldn't. I'm gonna need a. Um, you have two weeks to create a Math Citadel theme song with you're, Elix. You're gonna get a. You're gonna get a jingle, and I will try. But I mean, you'll get you'll get a jingle, and I no. won't be satisfied with it. I need your brain, and it has to be perfect, and it needs to perform, and it needs to perform creatively in the way that I think it should be creative. Okay, well, I'm gonna have to drop everything else, namely my day job and like eating and sleeping. No, I think, but but the kind of like well, the statement I just made to you. Do you think that's even possible? Even even if, even if you you could. Right, drop everything and do that. Do you really think that you can? Can you force your brain to be creative? I can't. I can't I, either. I never could, and I. I, I can't either. Never the, have been able to. The designs for the Mass Citadel shirts—they just kind of happened. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't choose when to be inspired. The the design, even some of my research. I mean, no, it just it just happened. In fact, it's usually what happens was. I read something, it inspires, I walk down a path a little bit, and then a question comes up. Well, okay, so I use this thing. Like, like for the, let's take the de- dependent random variable stuff. Where did that come from? Well, I used it as part of my thesis, right? Um, the first kind of dependence was originally done by my advisor, Dr. Andrzej Korzynowski, and it wasn't until kind of looking back at it when I was editing my thesis that I kind of ask the question, well, wait a minute, what happens if we do this same thing but have more than one categories? What happens if we relax it, right? You, you had two categories. What happens if we relax that to N? It's categorical now. Right. Right? And it's because, like, where would that have come from otherwise? It's yeah, just looking at have, it. Nobody could have stopped you in the middle of that and been like, look, whenever you're going over this, I'm going to need, you know, inspiration to strike, and you're going to have to come up with this idea. You can't. You can't predict it, and you can't. You can't put it on a schedule like that. And so, you but know. How, how do you, co- that's what business is. Right. It's schedules. Yes, yes. So movies, it's you pro- need to have one summer blockbuster per year yeah, per studio. Yeah, promises fulfilled. You have to be able to promise and fulfill them, but on a schedule. Like You, you need an Apple iPhone release every yeah, year. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I think it's, te- it's everything. Everything. Technology, music, movies, research and mathematics, anything. Engineering, too. A new design, anything that requires creative thought can't truly be put on a deadline. And like what I basically posed to you mm-hmm. and like your answer, if I tried to force it, you won't get the best, you won't get the best results. In fact, you may get it. But so what happens when you don't get best results? Those are called margin, marginal results, right? Yeah. Yeah. And well, the thing is like, nobody wants to hand you money if you're not going to, you can't give them a guarantee. So you guarantee them something that's less, and you say, oh, I will be able to give you something well, sure. that will be my See, best. If, if you're not going to give me money unless I guarantee you something, then I can't overpromise because, right, I can't guarantee you a paper next month. Right. So I'll, I'll make you the promise I can, and uh, that's that's where you get, you know, that's what ha- it's well, settling. To it's, me, that's where data science came from. Settling. That's, it's, well, I want, I want a solution to anomaly detection. That's a that's a really big problem, right? That I can't like give me a little bit. No, 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 no. I need something to put in front of a customer. Fine, I can give you a dashboard with a slider that that. You're asking for a compromise, like a. Yeah. But is that real? Is that really research? Is that really advanced no, development? No. I mean, and it's not. No, I wouldn't say so. So. It's it's more widespread than movies, right? Right, because even even the the article complained about about people. Yeah, I want something simplistic. Yes, right. This is clearly a horror movie. 
Right. They're I want f- to be able to sum it up in like a, in maybe half a sentence. Two words. I don't... And that's the problem. Like, maybe... Mm-hmm. Ma- you know what? Maybe that's why all my movie reviews are angry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I don't like them because I like nuance. I like to think. I like subtlety. And you like things you haven't seen before a bunch. I like things I haven't seen before. But the problem is what I like and what I'm asking for is clearly against the market or business or investment Yeah, trends. I think you kind of hit it on the head right there. Like, that's not what what you're asking for is not what's being paid for. Like, And why isn't it what's being paid for, right? Be, if people wanted... Yes. If people wanted new, interesting, daring things, even if you walked out of the theater going... I, I'm not sure yet how I feel about that one. I, I don't. I don't really know what I feel about it yet. I'm gonna have to think on it, or maybe give it another watch in case I miss something, or which you know whatever. Like that, that sort of experience is one I kind of enjoy myself. But if more people wanted it, yeah, it'd be paid for, right? Yeah, so yeah. we have to come to the conclusion that the vast majority of the public doesn't want it. So I mean, do you do, yeah. do you blame business for? essentially marginal crap because that's what it is it doesn't matter if it's music movies math research engineering a new iphone right each each time we iterate to something new it's marginal improvement at best is that business's fault because they won't invest in it or is it business's reaction to a cultural problem of needing something new and flashy on a schedule I, I want to say, the way it seems to me, is that business is as business does. That is not something that would change, but you're right. At the heart of it is actually a problem with with uh, the culture, with people not not really wanting to think very much, or they don't want something new. Like, when they say they want something new and flashy, they mean the old stuff, but in a new flashy wrapper. I mean, I see it, I see it with VCs. You know, some people have complained about that Silicon Valley thing. When was the last time somebody really invested in something new? I get that there's a new AI startup every two weeks getting mm. funded. Again, same old they, thing, but new flashy rapper. Right. Are they really different? Let's even take the storage industry. And, and, you know, certainly no offense meant to the various storage vendors out there. But for the most part, I I don't see massive new fundamentally new developments yeah how progressive is this actually this thing you're doing now this new thing how progressive is it from what you were doing last year i mean perhaps you know you got the move to district you know distributed storage arrays or or cloud or anything like that or you've got the move from hard drive to flash drive Mm. you know so maybe maybe it's not fair to pick on the storage industry because ultimately you're just trying to store data so the problem doesn't change on one level yeah that's probably not fair to pick on the storage industry there um i think i think i was probably a lot more accurate picking on like ai for example sure um but but everyone's investing in it right now Mm -hmm. how much of a difference is there really in it right but but once they do it they everyone's investing in it yeah so what happens if you come with a different notion of things like you know, I think I think instead of immediately trying to just do the big data thing where you apply a black box training whatever to a set of data until it learns something, and mm-hmm. it can do it quickly. Sure. You know? Because you've got computational power to rely on, right? Like you can toss tons of computational power at some problems and just kind of brute force them to a solution. Yeah. I wrote an article about that essentially being technical debt. If you're basically going gung-ho for something you don't understand, you could end up way off course with mm-hmm. things that have horrible implications. I read I read the one. I don't know if I sent that to you. There was, um, there was an article about how Pornhub is working on facial recognition for the people oh, in yeah. its database. Uh, yeah. um, no obvious problem there. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> Any of, any of it, so so you're you're rushing gung ho into things you don't you don't even fully understand. Moreover, the the you're just finding new applications of the same crap. Mm-hmm. Essentially, it's just like releasing sequels of the same thing or remakes of the same thing. You're not doing anything new. Yeah, I mean, like set aside the idea that okay, maybe yes, you go and apply for a job and you previously did some work on Pornhub and. Uh, 
now their classifier sees your badge or something and recognizes that your face is actually the face of, a, I don't know, a porn star under some moniker that you used on your account there. That's bad enough. But <laughs> as we know, AI is not always perfect. Yet. Nope, that's why we have confusion matrices. You look at misclassification. What happens when that happens to you and you never did work for Pornhub? But you know what? My misclassification rate is like 1 in 10,000. Yeah, that's comforting when you're the 1 in 10,000. Yeah, when you're when you're that guy, you don't really care to hear these these rates. <laughs> because we believe everything that comes out of a computer even though we have no idea what it's doing. Or nobody can sit down and tell you exactly, you know, how did they build this black box? Yeah. What's it made of? No. They it I mean it it's it but still, we go gung ho for it because yes. it's the next buzzword, and so everybody's talking about it. So you got to throw some money on it. So is that it, you know it's it's a tech version of the movie studios. Everybody's doing superhero movies now. Yeah, everybody's doing. And cause, why? Because Marvel did it, and they were super successful. Well, yes. they're still super People successful. Love them. So now we've got DC trying the same thing. I'm going to mm. say trying. Yeah. Um, I saw Suicide Squad. You are braver than I am in that regard. I have only watched like a couple of the DC movies. Well, you're the one that never says anything mean about a movie. Technically, I haven't said anything mean about them yet because I haven't watched them. Isn't that a statement in itself? It is a little bit. I'm not a DC person. I'll put, I'll put that well, out I'm there. Not, I'm not either, but the, I have to say that the there is an appeal of a grittier, darker set of movies i mean like marvel marvel's fun marvel, marvel is big bright and colorful and like uh it's still got great writing yeah it's still um it's got a little of everything mm-hmm. dc is designed you're not gonna get to me a good dc movie would have an r strong r yeah. rating well, like we like we have seen, a DC character can be made into a terrific set of movies, right? We saw the Nolan trilogy of oh, Batman yeah. films. Those and are it was, great. That was great. You can make some of those characters earnest. Like you can take a, a take on those characters, which is more serious and is deserving of a darker rating. But, uh, yeah, actually, the reason I haven't watched a lot of those DC movies is on one level because I watched Man of Steel and I felt burned. And I, didn't want to keep I haven't going. watched that one. I don't watch a movie over three. Well, I don't watch... I watch movies in like hour increments. I can I have the patience to swim for miles <laughs> straight. I have the patience to do research in mathematics for hours at a time. But if I'm like, hey, let's sit down and watch The Godfather. I n- I've never seen the middle hour of that movie. <laughs> I fell asleep every time. Like I can't even. Hey, I want to take a nap. It's like this movie is so slowly paced and so quiet that. <laughs> and I don't. It's because like. I don't necessarily need movies with constant action. Yeah. I loved a movie called um, Dead Poet Society. Mm. Which I haven't seen yet. We need, we need to watch that. It's a great movie. Robin Williams, fantastic. It actually kind of falls in line a little bit with the stuff we're talking about, but I'm not going to spoil it for you. Thank you. Um, what was the other one I was thinking of? Master and Commander. No, oh, okay. That's a good one, too. It doesn't... It, and it isn't that fast-paced... It's not that full of action, and, and Dead Poet Society certainly isn't. It's it's drama. Certainly not like the Avengers, the buildings crumbling no. everywhere. And um, but there's there's something else. I think in my case, for those, it was a different kind of story. Mm-hmm. I liked um, I liked Pride and Prejudice. What was that movie we watched? Uh... The horror film not that long ago, which I think we should watch for Halloween. Oh, The Witch? The Witch, yeah. Oh, now let's talk. Okay, so let's talk about what you can do mm-hmm. on a low budget yeah. with some seriously talented people. Well, and, and yeah, like, and that movie, that movie crept up and people started, it, like, realizing how awesome it is way after the fact. Like, yeah, it, it, it didn't really, you didn't see much advertisement for it. You mm-hmm. didn't see tons of stuff for it. In fact, I don't even think it was released in that many theaters. I don't think so either. But I'm, we went to see it because yeah. I I don't remember I don't remember how we saw it. I'm pretty sure by the time we were watching it in theaters, it had already been made for a year. Like you know what? I think it appeared at a film festival. Yeah, I think you're right. And it was really well received. So they did like a limited release. Yeah. And then we went to see it. Now there was there are occasional movies that have been absolutely not. I'm not going to say game changing, but just the kind that stick with you because they're different. So. With the witch, they they created a kind of New England kind of horror ish 
thing. But they did it. It was clearly a low budget film. Right. To right. me, that was clearly they didn't have the money to do much, but the writing yes. was so good. They took language, right? It's a historical It's a period piece. Like it puts it puts you right in uh, like, But uh, unlike period pieces you see where you you see modern language creep in. Yeah. They they used and they expected their audience to follow. Yeah, they didn't they didn't like uh make it easy on you. Right, you really had to pay attention. They yeah. didn't insult the intelligence of their audience by dumbing the language down to modern language. They expected you to keep up. And that kid. Oh. I mean, these the children acting in this movie, they kept up with the that dialogue. The performances in that film are fantastic. It, it was... There were no huge budgets for special effects. They, like... And yet it was genuinely unsettling. It was unsettling. It was, it was good. It was an effective horror movie. Like you can you can feel how you want to for those who haven't seen it, I won't spoil it, but you can feel how you want to about the end or which direction it was taken in. But yeah, the performances are totally solid and I left that movie feeling yeah, like I had really gotten And how do you think that, that pitch went, right? It's a low budget film. Yeah. It's not the only thing that they had to go on was writing and talent. Writing and acting talent. They didn't have the crutches of Tons of CGI or a huge budget or a huge set creation. I bet a lot or of that was filmed like, on... Or even a huge cast. No, like, they didn't. It was a pretty no. small cast. It wasn't even like an, you know, star of the moment. Robert Downey Jr. is in this one. I'm saying yeah. Robert Downey Jr. because I'm thinking about Marvel's Avengers. So here's another one. One that came that was so different. Actually, it inspired lots of other ones. Mm-hmm. Um, is one called Across the Universe. Ah, uh, yeah. It is... And if you haven't seen it, that one was another one that crept up out of nowhere. Mm. And even still, I still don't think... I think it actually won an art... Um, it won an Academy... It did win an Academy Award for like art direction or something, I think. Did it really? You keep talking. I'll see. All right. You look that up. I'm, I'm pretty sure it got something, but it came out of, out of nowhere, right? I saw it in theater because it looked kind of interesting. It was one of the most delightful, artistic, interesting... Films. It managed, it basically took all of the Beatles songs throughout their entire discography. Right. And it, managed to tell an entire story looking at, like, it's both a love story. It looks through kind of a, a period piece looking at the Vietnam era, a lot of the mm-hmm, political and mm-hmm. cultural stuff around it, and the Easter eggs in there. I mean, people's names are titles of Beatles songs. If they don't drop one of the songs in as part of the musical, it snuck into a line somewhere. Yeah. I mean, every single one is in that movie. Yeah, it has a massive effort and a, a creative, completely different way of, of approaching a musical or a right. movie. Right. Yeah. They, they, told, they told a great story in a totally different way with beautiful artistic direction, just mm-hmm. very strange sort of psychedelic. Well, you... Okay, like if I said... Um, a lot of symbolism. Like, there's no movie, if I were to say, it's kind of like Across the Universe. I can't, there is no other movie that is like Across the Universe. I mean, some of those, um, I want to say one other one kind of tried it, but it fizzled out and failed. Which one? I don't, musical? I, don't, I don't remember. Yeah, I really want to say they tried it with another one, but I don't remember. Technically, actually, Mamma Mia is based on some of the ABBA stuff, and that's yeah, a musical. that's true. That's that true. That came before, but, you know, whatever. Was it before? I'm pretty sure Mamma Mia came out before because it's been a musical for a long time. But the way it was done, everything about it was you just sit there watching that movie and this is different. Mm -hmm. Somebody had an idea that is in every sense of the word different. Yeah. Like you wouldn't say, going back to what I was just saying a second ago, you wouldn't use other movies to describe across the universe. You have to tell the story. You have to, like, basically say what it does. You can't say, Across the Universe is kind of like... Don't we miss that? I do. Don't you miss that? And and everywhere. I want to see something new. This is why I never say nice things about movies. I want to see something new. Show me something creative. And it, like, it's a love story, right? We've told love stories since the beginning of time, but look at how they did it. Yeah. They took a different direction. Like, I love the movie Jumanji. I don't need a Jumanji, too. Like... Because it, it was different, right? Yeah. When it first came out, like mm-hmm. check that out. That's a this idea of a you know a game being real. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Oh, yeah. by the way, tagging up on Across the Universe, it was only nominated for an Academy oh, Award in no. costume design. It didn't win one. Are you serious? It was nominated. It didn't win any awards, I don't think. That's baloney. It That's baloney. Nominated for Best Motion Picture Musical or Comedy for the Golden Globes, didn't win. Nominated Who won that for, year? Uh, I'll have to check. Nominated for a Best uh, Costume Design Academy Award, did not win. And... Nominated for a Glad Media Award, 19, the 19th Glad Media Awards for Best Film. And did not win. No. That's crap. Let's see who did win for That's costume crap. design on the 88th. Uh, it went to Elizabeth, the Golden Age. I don't even know that movie. I don't either. Another period piece, though. But, you know, across it's not really okay to say Across the Universe is a period piece because it actually spans like an entire... Like almost how many years? It like is it, a little bit. It, it a lot of it was the the pre Vietnam to Vietnam era, yes, and then a little bit of post Vietnam. Basically, how Vietnam affected people. I guess so. It's culturally. This, this right? is coming to a, an entirely different thing. It's like I, what I took away from that movie was, I don't know. I I, I guess I thought more about the other the other story aspects than the history part because I'm not a history knowledgeable person. It was, but we miss that, don't we? Yeah. I mean, I miss that everywhere. I miss, I miss people wanting something new. Yeah. Culturally, we, you know, and it's hard. Very few people can come out of, can really, excuse me, really do something new. Mm-hmm. But I think we've, I think we've lost that a little bit. Yeah. And, and Scorsese was right. Yeah. You know, everyone... Well, how do you pick a new restaurant? I mean, I get it. We look at, do you just look at the star reviews? I mean, I try to read them and be like, all right, so why did they actually do that? Because if they got food poisoning, yee. Right. But, you know, if you just look at it and you reject a restaurant because it, say, doesn't have a rating at all, right? Yeah. That's... How do you get started when when no one's made the decision for you that it's good? Mm-hmm. How are they supposed to get started? Do you end up with a self-fulfilling prophecy, don't you think? It's not what everyone else is doing, or it's not what everyone else is going to, therefore I won't. So what are you encouraging? The same kind of restaurants that everybody else is going, the same kind of movies, the same kind of art, music, very boring business, tech, and yet the tech that you depend on, you know, the tech that you depend on today is due to some of those people who chose to go a different direction, regardless of what everyone else was doing. Mm-hmm. The best movies we think of, Forrest Gump, for example, mm-hmm. that was a—I mean, that's an iconic movie now, mm-hmm. and it was—it re- was well received when it came out, if I'm not mistaken. I think so. But still, imagine—imagine imagine the pitch for that mm-hmm. being so different. Imagine pitching Forrest Gump, assuming nothing like that had been created. Imagine yeah, like, pitching that ima- today. Yeah, imagine pitching it and you're not, say, the, already the head of a production right. company. So yeah. let, let's say yeah. you're a, you, you until now have been an amateur filmmaker because, you know, the best that you, you've either had self-finance stuff or you've just done, and you get this chance. Yeah. And you get this chance. You get one chance to pitch to. Head of a movie studio. Yeah. Or like probably not the head because he probably wouldn't talk to you. Somebody just under him. And you pitch that. Yeah. Where do, do you think do you really think Forrest Gump would be accepted and and given the budget that it needed even if that budget was a fraction of a Marvel movie? Do you think they'd be given that budget? I think they'd pass on it. And yet it's no different it's no different than anything else. Everybody are you researching an AI? Well, it could potentially apply to it. Is it directly? Are you specifically looking at neural networks? Well, no. Not at the moment, no. We're not. And yet, you can miss out on so much art, mm-hmm. so much tech, life-changing mathematics. If the same people who invented the transistor at Bell Labs through years of exploration lived now, I don't think we'd have a transistor. Mm. I don't think we'd have queuing theory. I don't think we'd have any of that. Wasn't like the, wasn't 
Boole criticized for what he was working on at the time? He or? was. Yeah. Actually, yeah. What What is this good for? It's just pure math. It's, you know, admittedly, it took a couple hundred years. But uh, Boolean algebra is kind of important. Yeah, you're pretty much whatever you're listening to this on yeah. isn't possible without that. The uh, the tech field loves a lot to it. And yet he persisted and did it anyway because it was good and yeah. he thought it needed to be done. Mm-hmm. We need we need that back. We and not every it's okay. Not everyone can do that. Not everyone is a bull. It's true. Not everyone is an Ito. Not every stochastic calculus. I should drop more less mathy names. Come um, on. Show us some more. I just know too many mathematicians, I guess. <laughs> you know, kind of the point is we need to support that ideal more. Exploration for exploration's sake mm-hmm. is a fraction of the budget of what you what you do is your bread and butter, right? Mm-hmm. Marvel movies are bread and butter now. Yeah. What could it cost you to invest in a movie with a budget as small as The Witch, with potentially such a massive payoff, hmm. what's that going to cost you? And if it doesn't work, oh, well, it, you, you've lost more in the stock market in a day before. You're right. It's, uh, it's a gamble worth making, I suppose. It's... I want some more vision back. And it doesn't have to be vision necessarily, creative vision. Some people have it, some people don't. But it takes another special kind of vision to see the potential in someone else's creative vision. Yeah. I want some courage back. Mm-hmm. I think we need courage back in business and culture. That's, I think, what it boils down to. Yeah. Not just making the safe plays. And even then, like, you know, I'm not sitting here, let's just take our own field. You know, math departments do not get funding, right? Why not? It's too far out, right? It's, but how much do we really need? Right? I mean, I have a couple grand worth of books over there. That sounds like a high estimate. I don't know. Some of those books are Springer ones. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. They're not all Dover. Yeah, they're not all Dover books. I have a couple of whiteboards I bought from, what's that store? The Weird Stuff yeah. Warehouse? Like For the like 25 resale? bucks. A yeah. $1,500 computer in my brain. That's it. Mm-hmm. That's it. That's all we need. Mm-hmm. It's not I'm not even asking for I'm not asking for a massive chemistry lab with continual supplies of of equipment and reagents. Yeah. Have some courage. Have some courage. And if, if, let's say we can talk numbers. Let's talk numbers. Um typically a patent is valued, you know, when you're you're looking at valuation of the company. A uh, number I've been quoted is each patent is worth um a million to a million and a half dollars to your company. Mm. You know, if you're a startup and you're basically being bought out for your patent portfolio, that's kind of one kind of, we'll, we'll say, th- rule of thumb to value it. How much did they pay the people that come up with those ideas? So let's do some math here. Um, when I was at Dell, one of my papers, and it took me about... Let's just do an estimate. It's about six months. I wasn't working on it, you know, every single day, but about six months. Uh, three patents were written off that. So let's just go with that number. It's four and a half million dollars. With six months of my former salary, that means, you know, assuming that the six months of my salary was the investment amount, it means you had 89 times the return of your original investment. 89 times my salary. And that's not even assuming that it was built, how it became a product, right, whatever. Mm-hmm. This is such a small risk. Yeah. These small creative endeavors, that, that little tiny spark that can open up things that you never thought were possible. Mm-hmm. They never need that much to get started, right? It's, it's we'll, we'll go with a water analogy, right? Yeah, it's just if, diffusion. Look. I'm a Disney fan, right? Yeah. Everyone's seen Pocahontas. What does she do? <laughs> you know, she Grandmother Willow dips her her leaf branch. What is the branch of like a willow? It's a branch, right? Little yeah. floppy branch. Yeah. She dips it in the water, and then you just small it first, and then look how it grows. And all it took was that tiny action. That's the impact 
creative vision can have. And that's all of the energy and investment it takes to have that ripple effect. Mm -hmm. I think this discussion needs to come out. Math, it's, we're all super focused on math education. It's not enough of it. We need more of it. And then you stop. You, you just, you just stop. Kids study mathematics. It's super important. And then when they do, and they get their doctorate, and it becomes part of them, and they have all these ideas. Yeah, not that much. We don't really hire... The kind for business, please. Mathematicians. Now, yeah. if you want to be a data scientist, mm-hmm. make sure you're up to date on your coding. Put your money where your mouth is. Mm-hmm. If you want to encourage mathematics, then you can encourage it not just in schools for PR. You, you need to encourage it in your business as well. Mm-hmm. Especially when the, the encouragement of it in your business can can either open up a new market for you, increase your valuation by millions of dollars, or create billions of dollars worth of a new product if an application is built out. Or if you invest in a new movie. It's kind of a radical idea, but think of the person who, who all right, I'll give you the budget for Forrest Gump. How, or... Yeah, James Cameron, kind of the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. When he was doing his first movies. Titanic. Like, of course, he doesn't do small budget movies. Bad analogy. He did Alien. Was that a low budget movie? I actually don't know. I don't think so. I think it probably had a sizable budget. I was going to say, I don't think he does anything small budget. He did Piranha too. <laughs> so we've had some successes and failures. I'm trying to think of another one who would like, you know, how much money has Forrest Gump made over its initial investment? And I, I don't Gotta think that budget bunch. was that big. Oh, I could find out. Comparatively. Or you know, I'm trying to think of other small budget. Hey, what about the Blair Witch Project? Oh, now that definitely didn't take a lot of money. It didn't, but but how much money has it made? Let's just figure it out. Of course, that movie's also been sequelized and remade. But again, <laughs> look what you started. Yeah. And I mean, you, you know, we kind of slipped to talking just about the money aspect because... We were kind of forced to, right? That's what matters. That's how you speak to people now. But that's how you explain how how valuable something is like to to people for the most part. They they're going to skip over any creative value or like. I think that was what Sorsese was getting to. Is we we don't need to dismiss the the business and monetary value of something, but and I'll pick on category theory here. Sometimes things are worth exploring simply for the sake of exploration. Mm-hmm. Didn't we do that with space? That was that was for the sake of exploration. Any of this stuff, most mathematicians, I think rightly so, don't begin with a bunch of dollar signs in mind. We begin just like, what happens? What happens if you do this? What happens? Well, I don't know. I don't know where this is going to go. There, it needs to be a balance, and we're far too far. I mean, even then, even now, as pure mathematicians, we're still forced to speak the language that is the predominant cultural and, and business language. And we're asking for a little bit, come back to the other side and try to speak our language a little bit. Yeah, more like a meet us halfway kind of thing. Not a. Don't look down on the romantic idealists who just want to explore something. Those are the people, you know, sometimes they made something flashy and massive sometimes you don't notice the contribution at all but it's fundamental Mm -hmm. and sometimes we just created a little bit more knowledge it doesn't make it any less valuable nor does it really cost much it doesn't either it means changing the way people think about that and it is it is a tall order it's a very hard thing to do everything good happens by taking one bite or one step at a time Mm -hmm. You get through that giant chocolate cake from Matilda one bite at a time. Yeah, he was doing it sort of one fistful at a time. Now, there's a movie that probably didn't have a a big budget. But speaking of, on Blair Witch Project, $60,000 budget. Guess how much money from the box office. So this doesn't count DVD sales. All right, how much money? Uh, You guess a number. All right, um, $30 million. Higher. $300 million. Okay, a little lower. Okay, but not much. What's so no, what is it? About two hundred forty-eight point six million dollars. All right, we're gonna we're gonna do uh, the how many? What what rate of return was that? So sixty grand invested. One sec. How much did you say it was? Uh, the which one? Box which, office. Box office two hundred forty-eight point six million. 
All right. So from the initial investment, the box office rate of return was 4,142 <laughs> times the initial investment. Yeah. That's just the box office. Again, like that doesn't cover DVD sales. That doesn't cover the fact that they were able to make another movie and yet, and then like reboot the entire thing not that long ago. So. All right. The Blair Witch Project is going to be my new analogy for Have you math watched that movie? research. No, I haven't. That Wanna movie's watch that? pretty good. I All like right. that movie. All right. Halloween movie. We're watching it. But um, yeah, I think I might use the Blair Witch Project as, as our new analogy for, for mathematics research. But while we're on that subject, I just I should point out Blair Witch Project, how much do you know about it? You haven't seen I it. I know it's supposed to be kind of like, you know, self holding documentary style. What happened after that movie was successful? Oh. Tons of horror movies about found footage, like a, a grainy, like video cam style horror movies. All of that started coming out because that was successful. Same thing. So if you're on, the, if you were on the forefront of that, right? Because each subsequent one, yeah, 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 we've seen that before. It's going to make less money each subsequent time. If you were the first one, yeah. If you were the studio that invested in the Blair Witch Project, you made far more than your competitors who are trying to put out kind of their versions of it. I.e., be on the front. Take the take the risk every now and then. It's a small one. And that look was a you... small one. Like that's yeah. That's a disgustingly small risk compared to Hollywood studios. I agree. Like that's like that's like someone saying, "Well, it's going to be a little risky." Well, how much do you need investing? A dollar. Mm. But, uh, but your payoff could be forty two hundred dollars. Nah, like, come on, nobody rational would do that, I agree. right? Worst case, I've lost a dollar. <laughs> Best case, I've gained 4200 Yeah. Right? So we just need a little different thinking. Anyway, it, I, it, 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 we needed to, to read that because it just represents kind of a, a broader... And not, like, obviously we talk about mathematics. Yes, yes. Because that's what we do. I mean it for music. Art. Art in particular. Oh, I Creative love seeing expression. new art. Yeah. Um, not that, like, throw paint on a canvas crap. Mm-hmm. I mean art. And I've seen some cool stuff. And you usually see it at, like, these small festivals. And you just look at that and go, why are there, is there not tons of money being poured at you? You're, this is wonderful. Mostly it's people in booths that seem to have a hard time selling their stuff. Yeah. But, yeah. So it's it's just the state of things, and it's something that was really brought to the front of the mind by reading this article. It applies in all sorts of places and got us talking about it. Anyway, um, kind of kind of like what we hope. We hope that maybe this sparks some conversation as well, even if it just sparks some, some thinking. And, you know, obviously this probably generated some opinions one way or the other. Mm-hmm. Reach out to us. Let us know what you think. Please do. We love the feedback. You know, we don't mind we don't mind debates. Um, we don't we don't mind comments. Um, and we'll keep more videos and articles in our romantic idealistic mathematics site going. Mm-hmm. So check out stuff. Um, we're working on some new videos on research you yeah. know, to help explain some of the research on dependency. We're working on some stuff on drive failures. Jason's always taking great new pictures and uploading some new stuff in, in the galleries. We and very recently put up a new video on uh, modulo arithmetic. Right. And we'll keep the book reviews coming. So uh-huh. thanks for tuning in to our podcast. And mm-hmm. this one's a little bit longer, but until next time. I'm uh, Dr. Trailer. And I'm Jason Athcock. All right. Make sure you check us out on Twitter, uh, mm-hmm. at Meth Citadel. Or if you want to reach me, I am at Mathpocalypse. I'm at Jasonographer. And be sure to visit mathcitadel.com. All right. Thanks for listening. <laughs>